the Heritage Corporation, the world's largest producer of cultural heritage video, is proud to bring you the story of your name. It's a story that has been prepared by a team of dedicated professionals, experts in genealogy, heraldry and history. It's the proud story of your unique Irish heritage. At the end of this video, we'll give you helpful information about touring Ireland. We'll give you a list of our extensive range of name videos, not only Irish, but Scottish and Welsh too. And we'll show you some other attractive gifts that are specific to Irish family names. But for now, sit back and relax as the Heritage Corporation takes you on a very special journey into your past. is an old name, a very old name. But nothing in Ireland except maybe the land itself is as old as Newgrange. This ancient tomb was nearly 2,000 years old at the birth of Christ. For 5,000 years it has witnessed the arrival of the many and varied peoples who came to our shores. And sadly too has seen the departure of millions of Irish men and women who today are scattered all over the world. So let us go then, you and I, on an Irish journey, an hour's journey only, but endless in the imagination. A journey right through this beautiful country of ours, along the coasts and into the very lands and territories of your own Irish ancestors. These are the majestic cliffs of Moher. They stand defiant holding back the relentless waves. Below, the broad Atlantic stretches all the way 3,000 miles beyond the New World. When you stand on these cliffs, you stand on the edge of Ireland, you stand on the edge of Europe. Inland from here lies the fair land of Erin, Ireland, the home of your ancestors. This is the story of your proud Moor heritage. A story which begins in the 11th century and unfolds against a backdrop of invasion, war, rebellion and famine. We will take you to the ancient homelands of your ancestors in the mystical counties of Leash and Cork and show you how your Moor surname descends from both the ancient Irish clan tradition and the Norman tradition. We will hear of how these families intermingled and how their fortunes changed from the days of the warrior chieftain Gellifordrick to the defeat of the rebellious Murta. We will hear too of Lawrence Moore, who emigrated to America in the 19th century and discovered through him how you can start the search for your own ancestors. A search which will reveal the spirit of courage and resilience which has seen the name survive for nearly a thousand years. Irish surnames, which began a thousand years ago, developed in a number of ways. If a family took their father's name, they became known as Mac, like McCarthy, because Mac means the son of. But if they were called after a more remote ancestor, they used the O, which means descended from, as in, say, O'Brien. 
Meanwhile, the Normans often used Fitz instead of O or Mac, as in Fitzgerald, son of Gerald. Or you could be called after the job you did, as in Smith. Or the place you came from, as in Welsh, from Wales. For the 60 million people throughout the world who share an Irish ancestry, St. Patrick's Day is a time for them to come together to celebrate and rejoice in their Irish identity. Although your own family may have left these shores and settled in new lands, it is still possible to trace your ancestors back to their original homelands. Tom Lindert, one of Ireland's leading authorities on genealogy, has some useful advice. Well, it's very important that if someone's interested in doing your genealogy, that you get all your background information in your home country first. Uh, don't just try to jump straight over to Ireland. Um, the, the first thing is that you get a person that you know the most about from Ireland, be it an ancestor, um, their name, a date to put them in history, be it a birth date, marriage date, or death date, and then a locality, as, as narrow, narrow that down as much as possible, be it a county or a townland. But make sure you have the information together to begin with, and then um, make the next step over to do research in Ireland. Once you have located an ancestor and have some idea of where they originally came from in Ireland, the records which will allow you to trace your family history are, by and large, available to you. The first place to go to is the National Archives at the Four Courts in Dublin. Documents kept here such as Griffith's land valuations of the 19th century and the Thai the Plotman books are invaluable in the search for your ancestors. If we take the case of a namesake of yours, we can illustrate exactly how these documents can help you. Let's look, for example, at the case of Lawrence Moore. We know that Lawrence left Ireland in the 1850s for America where he married. We also know that at that time, the name Moore was most common in the Midland counties of Leash, Carlow and Offaly. At the Four Courts in Dublin, we checked the Griffiths land valuation records and found Lawrence's family in the record for Rathnagrew Upper in Hackettstown. With this information, we checked nearby Hackettstown Catholic Church, where we found that Lawrence was baptised there on the 27th of March, 1834, the son of Lawrence Moore and Anne Sweeney of Rathnagrew. With this knowledge, it is possible to trace the history of Lawrence's family. So you see, all you need are the basic details about an ancestor and the quest for information on your family roots can begin. The search for your ancestors is becoming easier all the time, thanks to a recent initiative called the Irish Genealogical Project. This is the Clare Heritage Center in Corofin. The center is at the very heart of a new and exciting development. The official surviving records relating to family history and genealogy are being collected throughout the county. They're being brought here and then put on computer. But Corofin's not alone in this. Many other heritage centers have opened up all over Ireland so that no matter where your family comes from, you should now be able to get an accurate record of your family history. It is possible to trace your ancestors even further back beyond your immediate family. But let's start at the beginning and take a look at the history, the culture and the country which shaped your forefathers. On the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland stands the prehistoric fort of Dún Angus, enigmatic, poised over the ocean, its ancient builders a mystery even to this day. Over 7,000 years had passed since the first settlers arrived in Ireland. Hunting in the young forests, they slowly ventured up the river valleys, building their dwellings from rough wood and animal hide, and forming small communities hidden in the forest. Two and a half thousand years before Christ, they had developed a society that was stable enough and wealthy enough to produce these majestic dolmens. This dolmen here 
is the Palna Brown Dolmen, situated in North Clare in the Burren country. Just another part of the wonderment that is ancient Ireland. They built mysterious circles of standing stones. These people we call the Firbolg, or the Fomorians, and the Tuatha de Danon, the legendary children of Dana, goddess of magic. Perhaps these early peoples were among your forebears, people who would have known the names of those who lie under the great dolmens. But older than Paul Nebron, older even than the pyramids, is the passage grave at New Grange in County Meath. Built over 5,000 years ago and designed so that on the winter solstice each year, at the moment of sunrise, a shaft of sunlight penetrates to the very heart of the mound, illuminating the intricate spirals carved in stone. New grains was where they paid tribute to their now forgotten gods. These people were superb craftsmen in stone but a new material was sweeping across Europe from Asia Minor. The Iron Age came to Ireland and the people who introduced the new material around 500 BC were the Celts, who for almost 2,000 years ruled Ireland as kings. The Celts were a major influence on the course of Irish history and instrumental in shaping our unique Irish identity. Let's listen to what leading archaeologist Barry Raftery of University College Dublin has to say about the Celts. Well, in the narrowest sense, the term Celtic refers to uh, a, a language, but it is entirely appropriate to use the term in a broad cultural context. Now, the earliest reference to the term Celt was made by the Greeks about the 6th century BC. They just referred to a specific cultural grouping in Europe as Keltoi. We do not, of course, know whether the Celts themselves used that phrase uh, to describe themselves. Now, in archaeological terms, the Celtic culture begins about 700 BC in Europe, continues until it was destroyed by the Romans around about the birth of Christ. And archaeologists have divided this culture into two broad phases, named after two major fine spots in Europe, an earlier phase, which is called the Hallstatt culture, and a later phase, which is called the Latin culture. It is the Latin Celts who are best exemplified in the archaeological record. There are very serious problems of archaeological interpretation. But what we can say is that the earliest indications of contact with the Celtic culture abroad appears in Ireland around about 600 BC, when there are some indications of a Hallstatt presence in the country. We have some Hallstatt material, but it's not very substantial. Around about 300 BC, there's a greater body of archaeological material in the country which we can certainly equate with the Celtic groups. In many ways, it displays native Irish idiosyncrasies which set it apart from the uh, material in the Latin areas outside the country. We have a vast body of Celtic literature surviving in the country. We have the epic cycle, the Ulster cycle, we have the Fíniachta, we have a whole range of mythology, we have a superb collection of early Irish nature poetry and other poetry, but probably the principal legacy of the Celts, the most enduring, is our Celtic personality. We certainly have a distinctive personality, a warmth, a friendliness. Uh, the classical commentators describe the belligerent character of the Celts, perhaps we have inherited that too, to a certain extent. But we certainly have a distinctive Celtic personality which sets us apart from all other European cultures. island on the edge of Europe. The island of your ancestors was divided up between a number of major Celtic clans. In the south, in what is now Munster, were the Oinacht and the Dalcash. In Connacht, to the west, were the Ibrin. In the province of Leinster were the Ehinslig, and to the north, in Ulster, 
were the Enail. These clans were in time joined by the great Viking and Norman families. The Moors descend from two great traditions. Those of the North have Enail blood, those of the South are Norman. Well, here we are, high up in the Mourne Mountains in the County Down. To the east, they sweep majestically down to the Irish Sea, while to the west, they overlook the vast lands of Ulster. These windswept mountains have watched generations of Moors march through the annals of Irish history. In these Mourne Mountains, you're at the very heart and centre of the great Moor story. A story which begins here in the green and tranquil, timeless and mysterious county of Leash. In the 10th century, these lands were one small part of the mighty Enail kingdom. From out of the ranks of the Enail, there emerged a highly respected warrior chieftain called Morga. Morga was of royal blood, being 21st in descent from a king of Ulster named Conal Cianach, and indeed his name means stately or noble in the old Irish language. One of Morga's descendants, probably a grandson, took his name as a mark of respect for him after his death, becoming O'Morga, which means descendant of Morga. His family were the leading family of the majestic county of Leash for the next six centuries, and their story makes up one half of the story of the Moor name. The other half had its beginnings in the wild and rugged county of Cork in the 12th century, with the arrival therein of a family of Normans called Moor. Although of Norman origin, these Moors adopted the culture, including the language of the native Irish, to such an extent that they've always been considered completely Irish. They changed their name to De Morga, meaning from the Moor, Morga being the old Irish word describing that particular type of landscape. The Moor surname has spread with the passage of time throughout Ireland. Today you'll find pockets of Moors in almost every county. But like most Irish families with strong roots associated with a particular place, the Moors are still to be found in greatest numbers in the homelands of their ancestors. Hurling, Ireland's national sport, is reminiscent of the time when the great clans of Ireland battle for land power and the high kingship. It was the strength of Christianity that forged the first real bonds of unity in Ireland. For the Irish took very well to Christianity. So well indeed, that in a very short time, her monks had established some of the most important ecclesiastical centers in the Christian world. Here in Glendalough, in County Wicklow, I always think the sense of Ireland's Christian past is particularly strong. There had been small settlements of monks scattered along the Irish coast for some time but it took St. Patrick to bring together the old religion of the Celts and the new Christianity. This new Irish Christianity turned out to be a powerful crusading force. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe was once more plunged into the Dark Ages. And strangely enough, that's what gave us, I think, our first emigrants, the young Irish monks who left their Irish monasteries and brought the flame of Christianity back into that pagan continent. At home in Ireland, the monks built the unique round towers, originally as bell towers, and then later used them for keeping safe their priceless chalices and manuscripts. In their workrooms, the monks channeled their passionate Celtic sensitivity into glowing color and intricate artwork. And certainly, the greatest and most beautiful of the manuscripts is the Book of Kells, now in the library of Trinity College, Dublin. The work of the monasteries, however, was to be disturbed by the arrival of the Vikings. For 200 years, they came as pirates to plunder gold from the great Irish monasteries. However, in 1014, they were finally defeated in battle by the High King of Ireland, Brian Boru, after which they became fully integrated into Irish society. The Vikings built Ireland's first towns and cities, including Dublin, Wexford, Cork and Limerick 
and their commercial ability is reflected today in Dublin's famous Moore Street Market. The Vikings left an indelible impression on the Irish. Their decline, coupled with the death of Brian Boru, meant that the high kingship of Ireland was, so to speak, up for grabs. There followed almost a century of political instability and unrest, while the greater Irish families fought amongst themselves for the title of High King of Ireland. The Normans, led by the great warrior Strongbow, arrived in 1169. Heavily protected by their coats of mail, they moved like modern tanks through the Irish countryside. They had arrived as mercenaries at the request of the deposed King of Leinster, but a combination of their military might and an attraction to the land of your ancestors induced them to make a more permanent foothold. They met with scant resistance from the Omorga of Leash, who was caught up at this time in a bloody and bitter clan war. When the Norman Moors were moving into their new homelands in Cork, the Amorga chieftain Don Lamorga was leading his people into battle against Machuin Mayanvui. Donal fell in this war, and the Amorgas, without his expert leadership, were no match for the might of the Norman war machine. In the course of time, the coming of the Normans had a most profound effect upon the fortunes of the Moore family. Situated as they were then in far-off Munster, they seemed well out of reach of the Normans for the time being. But when the Normans finally did attack, they found the Moors good and ready for them. In the ensuing struggle, both sides suddenly realized that alliance, particularly that of marriage, would produce far better results than either suspicions or confrontations. Following his victories in battle, Strongbow took the hand of the King of Leinster's daughter, Eva, in marriage. And less than two years later, he had taken the crown for himself. Stony towers are not always protective, for here in Waterford, at Reginald's Tower, the marriage of Strongbow and Eva started a trend that would eventually undermine Norman influence in Ireland. You see, within a century, the Normans and the Irish intermarried and the Normans adopted the Irish language and culture to a degree that made the English King John declare the Normans are more Irish than the Irish themselves. This intermarrying between the Normans and the native Irish had a profound effect on your Moor ancestors. Both branches of the family held lofty positions in Irish affairs and the posterity of both flourished. So much so that in time, both intermarried to such an extent that it became impossible to tell which Moors were of native Irish origin and which were Norman. Arranged as they were with the nine more to politics rather than passion, these marriages didn't always run smoothly. In 1354, Roderick O'Moore married into the Omorga family of Leash and was granted the title Lord of Leash. His inept leadership so exasperated his in-laws that the whole house rose up against him and killed him. Here at Bonretti Castle, the vibrant atmosphere of that period can be experienced in a banquet that is faithfully recreated using historical records from the time. My noble lords and ladies, my noble guests, the entry of your host this evening, the Earl of Thomond, Mr. Joe Lynch. <laughs> Food and drink in the old style, music and song. This is how your ancestors entertain their friends. This castle now awakes. Its ancient glory stirs. The clink of mail and laughter fills its halls, and we inherit all its chivalry. Bonratty bids you welcome. A toast to all you here. Slaita itself. Slaita itself. Let the banquet begin.
These great celebrations were constantly overshadowed by the ever-looming spectre of war. The Moors of Leash were never a family to shy away from a battle. They were attacked in 1404 by an English force. Under the leadership of Gelafordigo Moor, the Moors gave chase and encountered the English at Or Dove, the Black Ford. In the ensuing battle, the English were slaughtered in great numbers and the Moors made off with a great booty in horses, arms and armor. During the 1500s, the power of the Celtic chieftains began to wane under sustained military pressure from the forces of the English crown. This, in turn, led to a series of rebellions. The last great Celtic revolt ended here at Kinsale in 1601. It had been led by the mighty Hugh O'Neill of Tyrone. In the year 1609, O'Neill and many of the other Irish chieftains left our shores. This was called the Flight of the Earls. It heralded the end of the old Celtic ways. Now it was a new island, new kings, new centers of power. The Flight of the Earls is a testament to the concept of Ireland as an independent nation, the Celtic aristocracy choosing exile rather than submission. To consolidate their power in Ireland, the new rulers sent out clerks to record the names of Ireland, Unable to speak the Irish language, these clerks did not attempt to properly translate the indigenous names, but rather made approximate and phonetic translations. As you travel through Ireland today, you will notice how the signposts carry evidence of that name-changing process which began so long ago. For example, Bolia on Workig, meaning the town of the Murphys, became Bally Murphy. Cashlorn y Chunil simply became Castle Connell. The name Moor also went through its own changes. At the hands of English-speaking clerks who knew no different, the old Irish name O'Morga and the name adopted by the Normans De Mora both became O'Moor. Eventually, in most cases, the O was dropped, and because the English clerks were familiar with the name Moor in England, they used this as the translation of these two very different, very old Irish names. The essential Irish culture, however, remains strong and vibrant, and despite continued assault, it has remained so to this day. The Irish have always been proud of their heritage and culture, and nowhere is this more evident than in the art of heraldry. And here to tell you more about that is the former chief herald of Ireland, Gerard Slevin. Um, heraldry had its origin in the fact that the knight in medieval times, going into warfare, uh, was completely encased in armour, including his head. So there was no means of knowing who he was. So it became the practice to paint on his shield certain emblems or signs or symbols as a means of identification. Uh, heraldry has always had an extraordinary fascination for people, whatever it is about the shield shape and its contents. And in due course, uh, this personal practice spread to cities, universities, institutions, and is still very active. The primary purpose, as I have suggested, was identification. And I suppose that is still the essential purpose of heraldry, is personal or institutional identification. Your coat of arms is like a window to your heritage. Each part is full of stories and secrets. The shield is in green, displaying a golden lion in the rampant position with three gold stars called mullets above its head. The lion rampant is an age-old heraldic symbol of deathless courage. The mullets denote a divine blessing, suggesting that the family who bear this symbol are virtuous and learned. 
The crest, which is placed above the shield, is in the form of a hand clutching a sword, on which there are impaled three gory or bloody heads. Both the hand and the sword are ancient symbols of justice, but the three impaled heads could suggest that it is a justice swift to execute. The motto is in Irish and captures the spirit of this independent and warlike family. It reads, Conlon Abu, meaning Conlon to victory. Many, many Irish people certainly are entitled to use arms, yes. The, the registers of the office of arms, the genealogical office, as it is now, the office of the Chief Herald, has registers going back many centuries. The 17th century saw England convulsed by two civil wars in which Ireland inevitably became involved. The Second War was actually fought entirely on Irish soil between 1688 and 1691 and led to disastrous consequences for the Irish. Sixteen ninety one saw the ending of the Williamite Wars with the signing of the Treaty of Limerick signed on this very stone. The wars are fought between two kings, William of Orange and James II, both of whom laid claim to the throne of England. In the event, victory went to King William. For the Irish who supported James II, exiles seemed to be the only honourable option. Known to history as the Wild Geese, these honourable soldiers of fortune sailed from Limerick to Europe, bringing with them the surnames of Ireland. The Treaty of Limerick stated that if the Irish forces did not take an oath of allegiance to the Crown, they would be branded as outlaws in Ireland. The choice facing them, therefore, was imprisonment or exile. There were many moors among those countless thousands brave Irishmen who set sail for France and Spain. One of them, Murto Moor, distinguished himself as a commander of an Irish brigade in the French army, and his descendants were to rank among the nobility of France as Lords of Vermont. From the days of the early Christian missionaries to the present day, emigration has been an integral part of the history of the Irish people. From this small nation, millions of Irish people have traveled the world over to Europe, Asia, the Americas, Africa, and Australasia. Although many left in search of adventure or to find their fortunes, many others didn't have the choice. In the aftermath of the wild geese, which had seen the best and brightest of their day depart, Ireland was to undergo many changes, the most dramatic of which was the massive transfer of land ownership. As the land changed, so too did the politics. In 1801, the Irish Parliament in Dublin was dissolved. And as the last vestiges of power dwindled, so too did the wealth of the country, and the land sank into poverty. In 1845, a blight arrived. The potato, the staple diet of the Irish people, was totally destroyed. So began the great Irish famine. And so too began the greatest migration of the Irish people. Plentiful supplies of foodstuffs were exported to Britain while the Irish people were faced with emigration in order to survive. A letter written in 1847 captures the sense of devastation. It is early morning as I write this last note before departing. We now join a huge army forced to leave their native land. The heavy morning mist is a fitting curtain for the final scene, the climax of all our strivings against impossible odds. I cannot help but glance back through the pages of our history to the years when Ireland was a beacon of learning and faith whose light spread to all parts of Europe. God grant that those days of glory may someday return. Irish people emigrated in their hundreds of thousands. They set sail from Cove, Liverpool and Belfast. 
cramped together on overcrowded ships, rife with hunger and disease, they arrived in Montreal, New York, and Boston. In Australia, famine refugees followed those who had been transported there as convicts. Many of these convicts had been expelled from their home country on charges such as stealing bread. Others were belonging to revolutionary organizations. Despite their impoverished beginnings, the contribution made by those emigrants to their new countries was enormous. In the building of the modern world, from the late 17th century right up to the present day, the Irish have played a vital part in whatever society or culture they have settled in. Today, people of Irish descent number in excess of 70 million worldwide. Moors have always held a distinguished place in history. The brave Rory O'Moor was leader of the Irish Rebellion in 1641. Thomas Moore, the famous 19th century poet, who gave his name to Moore's melodies. And the Reverend Michael Moore, the only Catholic provost ever of Trinity College, Dublin. The list of distinguished Moors is constantly growing. Many centuries have passed since the first proud Oinuk chieftain took the name Moor. When you come to Ireland, of course, there are many places you want to see. But as a Moor, you must come here to the Ladies' View and the Lakes of Killarney in the county of Kerry. Because here, you'll most certainly find, I think, the gateway to the Moor Kingdom. The gateway to your heritage. From the earliest days of Irish history, the great name of Moor has been at the forefront of Irish life. Those Moors who chose exile and emigration rather than defeat brought their tradition of courage and independence with them. As a Moor, you can be proud of your heritage. And when you do go to Ireland to trace your roots, here are some of the things you may want to know. Ireland is only 300 miles long and about 150 miles wide. No part of the island is more than 70 miles from the sea. The Republic of Ireland takes up about three quarters of the island with Dublin as its capital. The remainder, Northern Ireland, is part of the United Kingdom and its capital is Belfast. The other main cities and towns are Cork, Limerick, Galway, Waterford, Sligo and Athlone. And in Northern Ireland, Derry or Londonderry, Enniskillen, Newry and Portadown. The population of the Republic is 3.5 million, that of Northern Ireland 1.5 million. Ireland's population is one of the youngest in Europe. 
aboard flight EI-104 to Shannon, Ireland. Our flight time will be approximately five hours. From the US, you can travel to Ireland with scheduled flights non-stop from New York, Boston and Atlanta, with convenient connections from over 100 US cities. From Canada, charter flights operate from Toronto to Shannon, Dublin and Belfast. From Britain, there are flights from London and more than a dozen other British airports to some 10 airports around Ireland, north and south. Aer Lingus, the Irish national airline, is celebrated for its friendly service and quiet efficiency. Over the years, its courteous staff have built up an enviable reputation among the world's most experienced travellers. Aer Lingus not only takes you to Ireland, but will help you plan the perfect vacation and arrange it for you. An Aer Lingus Discover Ireland vacation features everything from the deluxe hotels to cosy bed and breakfasts and a choice of fine rental cars from Avis. After all, no one knows Ireland like Aer Lingus. For a free copy of Aer Lingus Discover Ireland vacations, see your travel agent or call Aer Lingus at 1-800-223-6537.